No aliens were harmed in the creation of this park. They were all harmed after the park was created. He's not threatening anymore. John second He's a clown. You know, I hear shit like that, and I'm like, man, these aren't mutually exclusive. They didn't ruin the character by making a couple jokes. He was always funny. For fuck's sake, his name is the. Mm. We have one of the few villains in gaming that's naturally likable and charming. You want to know what happens when we take that away from him? A pleasure to meet you at last, Princess of Soliana. You get a boring, uncharismatic, uninteresting, mustache-twirling villain that kidnaps princesses and... and what was his plan even? And with its power, I will be able to control everything and rule... Real, dude, shut the fuck up. There's no showmanship, no theatrics, nothing. By removing the comedy from him, you're removing the charm that sets him apart from every other evil scientist out there. The problem isn't the comedy, it's how the comedy is used in conjunction with the level of threat and competency he has. When you don't back up your goofy antics with any sort of intimidation, just look at the forces. You took over the world, sure, but I didn't see any of it. No matter how much you talk shit and be vaguely sinister, if I don't actually see the damage you've caused as the bad guy, you're gonna look goofy without even making a joke. Others has the opposite problem. If you actually look past the Baldy McNoser line, there are some genuinely great scenes that showcase how much damage and suffering he's caused to this entire species, but they're swept under the rug for some bad improv. There is a difference between levity and mockery. If all you do is stumble around looking like a dumbass without actually posing a threat, then yeah, you look incompetent. If you talk a big game while also not posing a threat, not only you look incompetent, you're also boring. There is a nuance, there is a balance about how he goes about his business. If random shit just keeps happening out of nowhere, then there's no stakes no more. I'm not gonna take it serious just because you want me to. Show me something. Give me a reason to be afraid of you. The first one-on-one -on -one encounter you have with him is him falling on the ground and begging for mercy. Looking pathetic. And goofy. Except, this is after we put up a great fight against Sonic. One which you got to witness firsthand. His armada. His weapons. Him and all of his glory before falling to his knees. Which is then, followed by him taking back control of the situation and executing his plan. Listen, I ain't saying he's perfect, but he actually earns his comedic moments here, because we know what he's planning to do and how capable he is of doing it. We don't even see the complete effect of his actions, but the small parts we see are fucking terrifying. From this point on, every single comedic moment happens with you knowing full well what he's capable of. Tens of thousands of people dead, mass genocide of entire species, entire cities enslaved and destroyed with entire ecosystems burned to ashes. All of this done by an overweight, middle-aged, bald man. The doctor doesn't look threatening, because he doesn't need to. The mere fact that a man designed after an egg can cause atrocities like this while making you laugh is the whole point. You simply learn to work with the goof. Once you figure that out, you start to appreciate him with all the aspects intact. Shut on, friend. You know, this whole series is about me going through a character's history and seeing what makes them tick, and I mainly focus on story and narrative, and you know, that's like the main meat of it, you know? But how a character is represented in the gameplay itself is still very important, and I feel like I don't talk about that enough. Until now. Establishing a sense of threat is one of the main ways of keeping the player engaged. You know, they're the bad guy, you're the good guy, you beat the bad guy, you win the game. That uh, game design is so easy. But when the entire keynote of your game is running really fast, you don't have the luxury of having in-depth confrontation to establish a sense of threat. You know, this isn't Metal Gear, we can have one hour cutscenes. But you know what? Fuck that. I argue we have something way better. You see, we achieve this by designing a level in a way that makes the villain's presence known. Sonic games tend to be pretty good at this actually. Having the right obstacles, the right mood, setting the proper atmosphere to let you know what you're fighting against and for is key. If done right, you can feel it at the exact moment you stopped running on grass. And nowhere is this more evident than in It's weird that we've even seen the place. When you step inside, you know it's it's dreadful. By design. It's crazy. Everywhere you look, you see his face. Plastered 
all over the damn place. If you have any complaints, come deliver them to me in person. And make sure you know, full well, this is his house. If you can, that is. And you are not welcome. Every great last stage in Sonic has this in common. Even non-final stages that have this sort of imagery go a long way in establishing the looming threat, both in terms of aesthetic and difficulty. I would even argue that they're half the battle due to the nature of Sonic games. Chemical Plant is iconic because of how it juxtaposes the luscious green fields with this toxic mechanical environment, not because of whatever the f*** this is. Metropolis Zone, Death Egg, Egg Fleet, some of these places make you go through hell to have a fighting chance. There are more boss fights disguised as stages while others are there to elevate the narrative through gameplay and level design. You never really get to see the effects Dark Gaia had in Unleashed. You fight a couple monsters and that's about it. If you skip the cutscenes, everything is fine as far as you're concerned. Whereas in Forces, some of the stages actually go pretty hard with the aesthetic of Yeah, the world's kind of right now. But still, there are healthy fields and beautiful cities that ruin the immersion. Also, speaking of Metropolis, the actual like physical presence of the villain is still important, don't just drop him in a field somewhere just fucking around. I still have to give all this chaos and destruction a face. This just makes it seem like he's not in control of anything and just another spectator. He shines the brightest when he's heavily involved in everything you do. And not in a pulling the strings kind of way, more of a holding the planet hostage kind of way. You know, subtle. <laughs> The plan of action is what sets off the entire story, and the scale of it is what sets the tone and the trajectory of the narrative. So it's very important for you to be very clear about how the conflict is gonna play out. Establish all the obstacles, create the opposing values. If done right, this sustains the conflict throughout the entire game. Now by doing that, you're giving me, the player, the dumb little baby boy, something to actively look out for. A goal to follow, put the planet back together, stop the giant laser, save the animals, right? Don't just pretend to set up something then send me on some random errands like stop the power source, find shadow, stop another power source, another one. Oh, now I'm gonna drop a sun on you. What? Really? Really, you dipshit? Your grand plan was to drop a sun on them? How old are you? Is there any reason you needed to wait three days specifically to summon the sun? A sun that might or might not be real because we still don't know how the fucking ruby works. Set up the plan, establish all the components, execute. This is where the majority of the work goes into, the main chunk of the story. You remember all that talk about presence and shit? When you enter a planet, wisp and the orange machinery contrast the green fills, taking it over like a goddamn parasite. You know, the good shit. It varies on the tone, obviously. Maybe it's high stakes like SA2, or more mellow down like colors, or whatever the fuck Lost World was doing. The antagonists in the adventure games get so much praise because of how much of a driving force they are. There's a reason everyone always brings up that one scene. That's right, you already know what I'm talking about. I'm not even gonna show it. I, I am gonna show it for context. Not only it's just a great scene full of great character moments, but it's also one of the first instances of something very important. Something vital to the relationship with one blue bastard. He's no longer just another obstacle. Nah, we're way past that. Sonic the Hedgehog has to lose. When we reach the climax, every single one of these aspects come together. Whether it's because of a small oversight or getting too ambitious for his own good, it all culminates in the third stage. <laughs> There's nowhere left to run. It's time to end this, Sonic. This is one of my favorite tracks because of how it captures this pure hatred and rage he feels towards Sonic. When put into context, this is after Sonic lost. It's done. He won. Fair and square. I'm sick of you getting in the way every single time! The battles in this stage tell a story of struggle and desperation. I mean, do you remember when he sold the Master Emerald? You chased him down, you invaded his ship, you destroyed his robots, you brought him down again and again and again and again. He just won't. Quit. Stubborn little pincushion! Give up and die already! Two sides. Same coin. Equally as stubborn. Equally as cunning. With some big ass egos. Nothing stops him from wrecking his plans, and nothing stops him from coming back from it every single time.
The Eggman. <laughs>